And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth, verse 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The title of my message tonight as we approach the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, make room for Jesus. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Holy Spirit, do your work and have your way and accomplish what needs to be done for this service to be a complete success for you in every area. I declare victory in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. I want to focus the spotlight of your attention tonight on verse 7. It says again, and if we can put it up on the screen, verse 7, Luke 2 and verse 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I'm convinced the saddest words of tongue or pen are the sad, sad words right there. No room in the end. Think about that. The saddest words of tongue or pen are the sad, sad words. No room in the end. Now consider for a moment this baby that was born in Bethlehem of Judea. The most extraordinary baby ever to be born. Now get this. When Jesus was born, he was older than his own mother that gave birth to him. Now think about that. A baby that at his birth was older than his own mother. But this is true. Jesus was older than Mary when she gave birth to him. And Jesus was back there in the beginning of time, and with his hands, he created the universe. You remember what it says in John, the first chapter? Put it on the screen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, not anything was made. In Him was a life, and the life was a light of men. Skip down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among them, and we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This Jesus, think about this. One day, way back in the beginning of time, standing on the rim of the universe, he reached forth with the torch of his omnipotence. He sat ablaze the sun, and it hasn't gone out since. He hung the moon in his place. He put so many stars in the sky that astronomers still haven't got them all counted. Then he carved out valleys and piled up mountains, created oceans and seas, and set rivers and streams hunting them. This Jesus, as the crown of his creation, he made man out of dirt, out of clay. Then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And God looked at it. Jesus looked at it and said, it is good. Oh, but friend, it wasn't good for very long, was it? Because sin, that satanic ambassador from the kingdom of darkness, was soon knocking at the door of man's heart. And Adam and Eve fell. And the wage of sin is death. But God's only son, Jesus Christ, looked down at a group of us people here on the earth. We couldn't even pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And Jesus said, Father, I'm going to go down there and pay their debt. 
I'm going to go down there and pay their debt of death. And the one that could speak worlds into existence, one day about 2,000 years ago, got into his jeweled chariot, rode down the streets of gold, through the pretty white gates, across the stairway of the stars. And as the morning stars sang together and the escorting angels chanted their praises, the creator of the universe stepped out of his jeweled chariot, laid aside his kingly robes, and took upon himself the robes of sinful flesh. The brightest star put on his whitest robe, ran across the sky to point a finger at Bethlehem's babe and to say to the whole wide world, here he is, here he is, God's greatest man, man's greatest God, and the only perfect man ever to walk the face of the earth. That's the Jesus I'm preaching about tonight. He is the one in whom the prophet Isaiah said, behold, a virgin shall conceive and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Again he said his name shall be called Wonderful Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. This Jesus Emmanuel the Savior of the world was born in a barn. He wasn't born in a castle or a mansion, or a house. He was not born in a hospital or a doctor's office. He was born in a barn where the lowing of the cattle are heard. Now, why? Because people had come from all over the area and for the paying of their taxes. So there was no room in the inn. And as a result of that, the Savior of the world was born in a barn. Now, I have an idea that most all of you sitting here know what a barn is used for. It's where we keep the cattle, the horses, the pigs, the goats, the chickens. Why do we keep the animals, the various animals in the barn? Well, the truth is, we want to be able to go to that barn where the animals are as it's convenient for us. Oh, but we certainly don't want those animals coming into the center of our house, our home, and disrupting things and interfering with us. So we keep the animals in the barn. And for many people today, that's what they've done with Jesus. They put Jesus in the barn of their life. Oh, Jesus, we love you, but we don't want you to get in the way of our parties and our programs. We don't want you to come into the center of our life and get in the way of our television and our movies. Lord, we, we, we love you, but Lord, we don't want you to come in and, and, and into the center of our life and get in the way uh, and disrupt our sports activities and our ball games. Lord, we want to be able to go to you when it's convenient for us, but we don't want you to come in to interfere and disrupt with our schedule. And there are many people today that put Jesus in the barn of their life. And just before that, in verse 7, look at it again, it says they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Right? What are swaddling clothes? They're rags. They're leftovers. And for a lot of people, that's all they have for Jesus. The leftovers of their time and their talent. The leftovers of their, uh, their, their worship the leftovers of their money. And there are many people that have put Jesus in the barn of their life and they've wrapped him in rags. No, Lord, we don't want you to. We love you, but Lord, our, our actions speak louder than our words. We don't want you to come into the center of our life and get in the way of all of our activities. And then I draw your attention to the time when the wise men were looking for Jesus. They didn't know where he was, so they stopped over in Jerusalem, and they inquired of the religious leaders, and they said, we come to worship this baby, the, uh, this child, the king of the Jews. We followed the star of the east, and we don't know where he is. Do you know where he is? So the religious leaders, they didn't know where he was, so they went to King Herod and told him what had taken place. And then the wise man went on to find Jesus, but the religious leadership King Herod, do you remember what his response was, his reaction? 
Immediately, King Herod thought that his kingship was going to be threatened, that this baby, this child, Jesus, was going to grow up and unseat him and dethrone him. And so, King Herod put out marching orders for the Roman soldiers to kill all of the innocent children, the boys, two years old and younger. You remember the story. When this happened, no doubt, it was the most bizarre, ridiculous, murderous ravage recorded in the Word of God. I was in someone's home looking for, looking through their family Bible, and I came upon a two-page center spread, full color, artist depiction of what had taken place when these precious babies were murdered. Oh, it was a horrible sight. Roman soldiers were taking spears and swords and knives and plunging them through these little baby children, these boys' bodies, and little boys kicking in a puddle of their own blood. Mothers running the streets of Bethlehem, screaming for their lives, for the lives of their, their boys. And as I looked at that picture, I had to stop and ask myself, why, why the godless killing of all of these innocent children? You know why? Because there was no room for Jesus in Bethlehem. But you know what? It's not any better today than it was then. In fact, it's worse. You see, in King Herod's day, the devil was murdering the children, the boys, two years old and younger. But now, even worse, the devil has been murdering millions and millions of babies even before they come out of their mother's womb. And as I think about that, why? Why the godless killing of all of the innocent children with abortion? The truth is, the reason all of these precious babies, not just boys, but girls too, the reason why these precious babies are being murdered is because there's no room for Jesus in America. But there was room for one baby in Bethlehem, the sweet holy child Jesus Joseph and Mary. Joseph was warned of an angel, and Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt. So watch this. There was no room for Jesus in the inn, no room for Jesus in Bethlehem, no room for Jesus in King Herod's heart, no room for Jesus in the Roman soldiers' hearts. Now, you would expect for the world not to have room for Jesus, wouldn't you? That makes sense. But again, what about the so-called spiritual leadership of that day? They didn't have room for Jesus either. Again, I draw your attention back to when the wise men were looking for Jesus and they stopped in Jerusalem. They inquired of the religious leadership. And the religious leadership of that day, the so-called spiritual leadership of that day in Jerusalem, they pointed the wise men in the direction of Jesus but the religious leadership, they didn't go find him. The religious leader said, said, as far as we can tell, this baby that you've described, this child was born in a little town south of here, about six miles, a place called Bethlehem. So the wise men went on to find Jesus. Don't you think it would have been a good idea for the religious leadership of that day to be looking for Jesus too? Why do you think they did not go to find Jesus with the wise men? Oh, no doubt they were just too busy to make room for Jesus. Maybe they had a, a, a church business meeting or a, a, a church board meeting. Maybe they had a, 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 a worship practice for their church. They didn't have time to walk six miles across town to see Jesus. It seemed that the Old Testament prophets stood on their tiptoes to get one glimpse of the coming Messiah. And now in the day and the hour that Jesus was being born, the religious leadership of that day wouldn't walk six miles across town to find him. No, God, no doubt they were so caught up in religious gymnastics, perhaps charismatic calisthenics. They were caught up in church work, and they lost sight of the work of the church. But my friend, today there is an, an, an indictment on the spiritual leadership and the congregations 
of people all over America that don't make room for Jesus. You know, no doubt the leadership of that day, perhaps they were in a prayer meeting. Now, the only way that we'll see God do what he wants to do is through prayer and fasting. But this is not a time that they should have been having a prayer meeting. This is a time when they should have been running as fast as they could to find the King of kings and the Lord of lords and to bow down and worship him. But you see, today, in too many of our churches, we get so caught up in church work, we lose sight of the work of the church. You and me, we need to measure everything that we do and ask ourselves, how is what I'm doing going to help build the kingdom of God? Can I hear an amen? But you see, there are so many people in our congregations today that have got such a lukewarm, lethargic, apathetical, indifferent attitude towards serving God. I heard about one church, the pastor, he could not get hardly anybody to come to his evening services. Finally, out of frustration, this pastor closed down his Sunday night and Wednesday night services. Six months later, when the board found out about it, <laughs> they fired him. <laughs> Many churches, it would be six months to a year before a big portion of the church even realized they weren't having evening services. But we need to make room for Jesus. I know people, and you do too, they'll drive 100 miles to watch a ball game, eat a weenie sandwich, and drink a Coke. And some of those same people won't drive across town to come to the house of God. We need to make room for Jesus. Get him out of the butt of your life and put him on the throne of your heart. Get him out of the rags and put him in the riches. Many, I should say a handful, of our spiritual leadership don't make room for Jesus. Now think about this. The, the religious leadership in Jerusalem, they were pointing the wise men in the direction of Jesus. But that religious leadership that were pointing people in the direction of Jesus, they themselves were not living right. Oh my. Today, we have a handful of preachers in our pulpits that are pointing people in the direction of Jesus, but they themselves are motivated by financial gain or they're full of pride and arrogance and rebellion. We have a handful of preachers uh, uh, in, the, in our pulpits today that are not living for God. Oh, they're pointing people in the direction of Jesus, but they themselves are not living for God. I know of a preacher right now, an evangelist. If I called his name, everybody in here would know who he is. I'm not going to do that. But he won't come preach for you unless you guarantee him $20,000 up front. I call that prostituting the gospel. That's what I call it. I have a pastor friend that pastors a, a, a thriving church in Birmingham, Alabama. He had a, a, an evangelist come preach for him, a different evangelist, but everybody in here would know who he is, won't call his name, that he preached for this pastor friend of mine. And this pastor friend of mine, at the close of the service, proudly handed him a check for $7,000. That evangelist looked at the check and handed it back to the pastor and said, that won't pay my bills. That's not enough money. I say, whatever happened to preaching for Jesus? You can't put a price on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Angie will tell you, I've, uh, we, we've been in the ministry. I've been in the ministry now for a little over 38 years, and we have never, ever uh, uh, required a certain amount of money to come preach anywhere. We go anywhere that the Holy Spirit says to go, and we never put a price on the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we've got a handful of preachers today in these last days that are living godless, immoral lives. Hear me tonight. Listen carefully. Don't put your faith in a preacher. If that preacher falls into sin, then you will walk away from God. You keep your faith in Jesus Christ. He will never fail you. He will never let you down. And he's alive and he's here to stay. Make room for Jesus. But when Jesus started his earthly ministry, it didn't get any better. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20, put it on the screen. It says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place 
to lay his head. I don't know how humble the home is that you live in. It's still better than the one that Jesus had. According to that, Jesus didn't have a home to lay his head. We get so uh, fussy about our pillows, whether they're foam or, or, or feather. I like a my pillow. When I say my pillow, I mean a Mike Lindell my pillow. That's my that's my favorite. Jesus did not have a pillow to get fussy about. The foxes were better off than he was. The birds were better off than he was. In John 7, verse 53, it says that Jesus uh, uh, was teaching, and, and when he finished his teaching, everybody went to their own home. They went their own way and went to their own home. The very next verse, John chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Yes, he went to pray, but he did not have a home to go to. When Jesus there was, they needed to make room for Jesus. They didn't make room for Jesus. There was no room for Jesus in Gadara, the city of Gadara. Now, what was the significance here? Watch this. In Gadara, Jesus came to that coast, and he was approached by two demon-possessed men. And those demons said, we know you're the Son of God. If you must cast us out... Let us go into those hogs. And what did Jesus do? He answered those demons' prayer request. <laughs> now, you may know somebody that gets their prayers answered all the time. Don't let that be the only gauge as to whether or not they're living right <laughs> because Jesus even answered the request of these demons. And so those demons come out of those uh, men they plunged themselves and went into those hogs. They plunged themselves into the water, into that lake. And the people from Gadara, the people taking care of those hogs, ran into the city of Gadara and told everybody what had happened. And what was their response? Oh, you'd think that revival would break loose, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd think that they would extend those revival services with a miracle of deliverance like that. But here's what happened instead. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 34. It says, everybody from the city came out, and let's put it on the screen. It says that they besought Jesus that he would leave their coast. What was the problem? They said, get out of here, Jesus. We don't want you in Gadara anymore. You know what the problem was? In Gadara, hog raising was more important than soul winning. And you know those hogs, they symbolize your job, and mine. And the truth is, there are people today that get so caught up in a hectic work schedule that they don't make room for Jesus. There are people on their jobs today that will do things to, that violate the Word of God and their own convictions just to get a paycheck. And let's not fall into the same trap that they fell into in the city of Gadara and not making room for Jesus. They said, get out of here, Jesus. So there was no room for Jesus in Gadara. Are you following me tonight? And then there was no room for Jesus in Nazareth. Now, what was the significance of Nazareth? It was Jesus' own hometown. Look at this with me. It says... So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. So it's his own hometown. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So this, it's not just his own hometown. It's also his own home church. Are you following me here? So this is the area where he was raised. He goes into that synagogue, and he's in his own hometown, his own home church, and look what he said. And he handed the book. Of the, to the prophet, uh, uh, the, of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, but he has an, and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover to, of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all of them in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then for verse 21, I don't even know if I had him put this up, but this is important. And he, 
he began to say to them, today this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. So, you know what, you know what the response was of the religious leadership whenever Jesus was, was comparing himself to the likes of Isaiah? Oh, they didn't want to hear that. So, the religious leadership, they grabbed Jesus, they took him out to the edge of the city of Nazareth, and they were going to throw him off of a cliff, a bluff, a hill, to a horrible death. And the Bible says in that same passage of Scripture that Jesus passed through the midst of them and went his own way. But hear me. There was no room for Jesus in his own hometown and his own home church. Now think about this. What if that would have been you? And you'd have gone off to Bible college and you came back to the assembly and you were so excited about what God had shown you and what the Holy Spirit was speaking to you and through you. And so you get up in front of the church body at the assembly and you begin to share what the Lord was doing. And the response of the church to be, this would never happen, but just think about this. The response of the church would be to want to take you out to the edge of West Monroe and throw you off of a bluff. This is what happened to Jesus. But oh, 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 if Jesus would have been a famous ball player or a movie star or a TV star or a social media star, oh, if Jesus would have been a famous governor or if he would have been a famous uh, um, president, oh, you know, and he came back to his own hometown, you know what they would have done? They would have had a big banquet and, and had him set at the head table. And they would have named a street after him or, or perhaps even a building after him. They would have had all kinds of marching and shouting up and down the streets of his own hometown. And they would have uh, given a big banquet if he had been a famous ball player or a TV star or a movie star or a social media star, if he would have been a famous governor or if he would have been a famous president. But hear me tonight, Jesus is better than any ball player that's ever lived. He's better than any ball team that's ever existed. He's better than any any ball game that's ever been played. He's better than any TV star or movie star or social media star or governor or president or anybody else. And we need to make room for Jesus to be the Lord of our life on the throne of our hearts. Somebody give him praise tonight. Can y'all hear me all right? So there was no room for Jesus in Nazareth. No room for Jesus when he started his ministry. There is no room for Jesus in King Herod's heart or the Roman soldiers' hearts or the inn or Bethlehem. But then there was no room for Jesus in Jerusalem. Now watch the significance. Jerusalem is the spiritual capital of the world. They didn't have room for Jesus. Again, Jesus was teaching. John chapter 8, verses 58 and verse 59. It says, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. No doubt. It was just a short period of time after this that Jesus rejected in the religious capital of the world, Jerusalem. No doubt, he climbed up on top of that hill overlooking Jerusalem. And in Matthew 23 and verse 37, put it up on the screen, Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou dost kill us the prophets and stone them that are sent unto thee. How I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't let me. Think about this. Judas had no room for Jesus. He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver, right? Pilate had no room for Jesus. He turned him over to be crucified. The Jews had no room for Jesus. They said, let his blood be on our heads. Again, the Roman soldiers had no room for Jesus. They plunged a spear in his side. These were dark days as the Son of God was being crucified. Listen carefully. Things are not any better today than they were then. In fact, they're worse. 
because today we have the pilots and the Herods of our time, the crooked politicians, the politically correct, the liberal news media, the ACLU, the National Organization for Women, Planned Parenthood, and other godless organizations promoting their homosexual and their transgender uh, 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 activity. Listen, I've never seen such an all-out attack as I've seen right now on nativity scenes on government and school property. I've never seen it like I have now. And in our public school systems in America, hear me, God is not welcome. You got to take the Ten Commandments off the wall, can't sing Christmas carols, can't read the Bible in school, can't pray in school, can't have the things of God in school, and yet those same schools are rolling out the red carpet for sorcery and witchcraft, rolling, rolling out the red carpet for the things of the devil and the things of the world. Are you beginning to get the picture? Are you beginning to see which way the wind is blowing? And I'll take this a step further. Listen carefully. There are many people in America today that don't want Jesus to be a part of Christmas. Now think about that. How would, how would you like for it to be your birthday? <laughs> And people to not want you to get in the way of your own birthday. How would you like for it to be your birthday and for people to not invite you to your own birthday party? But this is the mentality of so many people in America who claim to be Christians even that are so spiritually shallow. Oh, in many of our, in many of our churches, Jesus is not welcome in our churches, but Santa Claus is. And I'm not getting on a soapbox here. But we need to make room for Jesus to be the Lord of our life on the throne of our heart. Amen? Amen. And I'll take this a step further since we're five days from Christmas. I want to challenge you tonight that when Christmas comes, that you, the amount of money, the amount of money that you spend on Jesus will surpass the amount of money that you spend on anybody else, whether it be your husband, your wife, your children. Now, Christmas, giving is a part of Christmas. You say, how in the world? What are you talking about, Brother Todd? Y'all quit shouting so much, I'm going to lose my place here, okay? You say, well, how in the world can you do that? Matthew 25 says, Jesus said, Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take care of the poor. When you've done it to the least of these, Jesus said, you've done it unto me. And let's not fall into the same trap of so, that so many people, even Christians, fall into by leaving Jesus out of his own birthday. And there are people in the church today that say, well, you know, Brother Todd, I love God, but I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to worship. I don't have time to come to the house of God. Listen to me. If you've got so much business to attend to that you can't read your Bible and pray and have an active, intimate marriage relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and serve the Lord and come to the house of God, if you've got so much business to attend to that you can't do the things of God, you've got more business than God ever intended for you to have. And it's time for us to get Jesus out of the barn of our life and get him on the throne of your heart. Get him out of the rags, the leftovers of your life and get him in the riches. Hear me tonight. Listen carefully. Jesus is the king of kings. You don't make him the king of kings. He's already the king of kings. You just make him the king of your life. So, they finally found room for Jesus. It wasn't in the inn. It wasn't in Bethlehem. It wasn't in King Herod's heart or the Roman soldiers' hearts. It wasn't in the heart of Judas or Pilate. It wasn't in the heart of the Jews. It wasn't in the heart. It wasn't in... Uh, Gadara or Nazareth or Jerusalem. They found room for Jesus here on the earth in one place, one place. 
on the old rugged cross. Put a picture of it up. Heaven wasn't ready for him yet. And the earth didn't want him anymore. And the Son of God hung on that old rugged cross for you and me. Hear me. If you make room for Jesus to be the Lord of your life on the throne of your heart down here on the earth, he'll make room for you in heaven. That's the good thing. But if you don't make room for Jesus here on the earth, then when it's time to leave this earth, there will be no room for you in heaven. Hear me tonight. It's time for us in every area of our life. And I know I'm talking here and preaching to some of the most faithful people to be out here on a Wednesday night. But the truth is, every one of us need to make more room for Jesus. Whatever area it is, your prayer life, devotion time, your tithing, giving, worship, whatever it is, we all need to make more room for Jesus than we have been. Can I hear an amen to that?